of this webinar is welcoming Afghan newcomer students back to school. Uh, this is the second session of this. We held an earlier one for that was more conducive for East Coast folks. And we're happy to offer this a second time this evening uh, on the East Coast and this afternoon for the West Coast. Uh, this webinar will last for one hour and will be recorded. The recording will be uploaded to the Switchboard website within the next 24 hours and will also be sent out to all registered participants, even those who may not have been able to attend. So we've all been on Zoom for quite a while now, so this might be a little bit redundant for some of y'all, but just want to go over some quick logistics. Uh, because of the large number of participants we have, and given that this is a webinar format, all participants are muted. Uh, you may join with audio and switch which audio device you're using, using the functions at the bottom left of your screen. Uh, we have changed the chat settings so that you can only send messages to the hosts and the panelists. Uh, that should be open. Um, however, even though you cannot send chats to everyone, we ask that you continue keeping an eye on the chat yourself for messages from our team, as we'll be sending resources throughout the presentation that are relevant to the material we're covering. Uh, even though the chat is disabled for y'all to respond to everyone, we do have ways for you to participate openly in several ways. One of those is through Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop those into the Q&A box. Uh, when you write those in, they will appear for hosts and panelists. We will answer them to the best of our ability, either in the session by typing a response, or we will save that question for the end during our set time for questions and answers. Um, you can also use the thumbs up function. Um, if you see a question there, you can vote for it to be addressed as well, and that will give us an idea of y'all's priorities. Uh, last but not least, in terms of logistics, you have the option to turn on automated closed captioning on today's webinar. To do so, you can click the CC or live transcript button at the bottom. You can choose subtitles or the full transcript. You also have options to change the font size and other parameters. You can turn off the closed captioning at any time if you'd like, um, and know that because it is automatically generated, it may not be completely accurate with what we're saying. However, following the webinar, along with several other resources, we'll post a fully edited transcript to the Switchboard website, um, as we do with all of our audio and video materials. So just want to take a moment to go over our learning objectives for today. Uh, so by the end of today's webinar session, you will be able to describe the circumstances of newly arrived Afghan students and their families, including the challenges they may face as they seek to adapt to the American education system, name core considerations for working with Afghan students and their families, name ways to create healing classrooms and learning spaces in your school setting. Today's speakers are as follows. We have Sarah Rowbottom, a, technical, a senior technical advisor with the International Rescue Committee, supporting education and youth programs across the US and Europe. She has worked in domestic and international youth development for over 15 years, including seven years directing IRC education programs in New York City. As a subject matter expert for Switchboard, she led the development of the toolkit supporting Afghan students in schools and youth programs in the United States, which this webinar is based off of. Sarah is passionate about the power of creating inclusive healing learning spaces to empower youth to thrive. We're also joined by Medina Masumi, a switchboard training officer focusing on cultural awareness. She brings 12 years of experience working as a licensed K through 12 school counselor. As the daughter of Afghan refugees, Medina is also deeply familiar with the challenges of refugee integration. She holds a master of education in school counseling from George Mason University. And finally, we have myself, Rob Callis. I am a switchboard training officer with a focus on community integration. I previously worked with Refugees for World Relief, where I managed a youth services program. I worked in global health in the past, and I consider myself to be a lifelong educator. I speak Swahili and Spanish, and I am ESL certified. Before we go further, I want to also acknowledge that there were a number of people who were involved in the development of the materials that went into creating this webinar. Uh, not only did Sarah Robottom, who's on this call with us, uh, serve as one of the authors alongside Wais Kairandesh. Uh, we also have several people who reviewed the material as well. So just wanted to give um, a shout out to them on this slide. So 
Um, especially shout out to Tigus Coleman, who's joining us in the back end of this call um, and also works on the switchboard team. So as we are getting ready to cover the material of this presentation, we wanna hear from you guys, one of those interactive pieces that I mentioned before. We wanna get a pulse on who it is that we're talking to and who it is that this training is for. Uh, so maybe you've used uh, Slido before. If you haven't, there are a couple ways you can interact with it. Uh, you can use a smartphone and use your camera to scan the QR code, uh, and that'll take you right to a place where you can start responding. Or you can go to slido.com and put in the code uh, below 2036610. Looks like a lot of you guys are already mastering this. Fabulous job. Good to get a sense of we've got school educators. We've got a lot of other. Um, if you are other, definitely drop in the chat what your role might be. We'd love to hear, um, again, what kinds of roles that y'all hold and um, just to get a sense of who we're working with. All right, we've got a family liaison. Lovely. That's great. Very important role. We're really glad um, the school system that you're in uh, has family liaisons. Interpreter services, amazing. A lot, a lot of educators on this call. This is good. Our earlier one, we had a lot of resettlement staff. Um, so this is really good. Uh, grateful for all that y'all do. We've been there. We've done that. Got some interpreters, ORR folks. Awesome, cool, loving this. Another liaison, cultural navigator between New Americans and the schools. This is great. Y'all are doing exceptionally important work. We are so humbled to be on this call with you guys. All right, still active. I'm sure some of y'all are still contributing to this poll. Um, thank you so much. It's helpful for us to get a sense of who we're working with, like I said. Going to jump to another poll. Again, we're just sort of practicing the participatory stuff also because we have more interactive parts. Uh, we have another one for where you are joining us from. So please write your location, the city, and state. All right, we've got Washington real big, a couple Washington people. I see Fairfax, which is great. We've got someone on the call who. Uh, uh, one of our presenters is from Fairfax. All right. We got a Raleigh NC. I'm a North Carolinian myself. Good to see you here. Charlotte NC again, really great. All right. So as you can see, we've got a lot of variety and a lot of spread of where folks are serving and where folks are working with refugees. So we acknowledge that the context in which y'all work is vastly different. However, we hope that the strategies that we're going to be discussing today are relevant to all of the work that you do. Um, so thank you for joining, and I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Medina. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, hello, and thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I'm excited that there are so many educators and counselors on the call, and shout out to my FCPS folks if you're out there. Um, if you do work in the school settings, we hope that your year is off to a wonderful start as you're welcoming back students into your classrooms and your schools. And with that said, we know that schools across the United States have enrolled and are going to continue to enroll significant numbers of, of students from Afghanistan. Um, as we all know, this is a result of the events that have unfolded in the past year uh, when the Afghan government fell last August. So it's led to over 76,000 Afghans entering into the United States in the past year. And obviously, along with that, there's going to be a large number of students who have enrolled in our schools and will continue to do so. Um, Afghanistan is a country that has seen more than four decades of conflict and of war. And so it's really important to have an understanding of how that's affected the students that you guys are going to be possibly receiving. We can proceed to the next slide. In this slide, we're going to go over some social and cultural context uh, pieces to keep in mind when working with recently arrived Afghans. Um, one of the most important things to be aware of is that in Afghanistan, there's over 30 languages spoken in the country, but the majority of Afghans are going to speak Dari or Pashto. Dari is also interchangeably referred to as Farsi. Dari and Pashto are entirely different languages 
So just because you speak one, it doesn't mean that you have any understanding of the other. They're very different from one another. Some Afghans do sp speak both Dari and Pashto, but they're usually going to be more efficient in one language than another. <clears throat> it's also important to emphasize that Dari and Farsi, as I said before, are interchangeably used among Afghans. So if you hear an Afghan say that they speak Farsi, they're actually referring to the dialect spoken in Afghanistan, not Iran. The two dialects of Farsi are similar when you're writing, but when you're speaking, they're going to sound very different. So when you were thinking about the school setting, if a parent needs an interpreter for Farsi or Dari, it's important to make that distinction to make sure the person speaking to them is someone who has the Afghan dialect. Approximately 5% of Afghans coming in will be speaking English fluently. So most of your students will be, will be having a limited English proficiency. Also, Afghan children entering in the United States are going to have lots of different levels of uh, prior access to formal education. You're going to find that your students coming from Kabul, for example, might have had more experience with school than children coming in from a more rural area. Uh, Kabul is the capital of the country, so a lot of the country's resources tend to fill, uh, infiltrate there. And so in recent years, they've even had private schools and most and that are it's, it's they're more established. And so even most of the country's colleges are in Kabul as well. So generally speaking, um, the students who will have limited or maybe even no formal education, they tend to be girls that have lived in rural or conservative areas. Uh, children that might come from parts of Afghanistan where there's been constant war or conflict. And so there's been a lot of interruption in their education, uh, children from nomadic or poor families who have had limited access to education, and also children whose head of uh, their household had informal education themselves. These are uh, the students who you're gonna see with very limited or maybe no educational background. Recent statistics suggest that half of female children uh, and two thirds of male children attend a uh, school at the middle school level and even fewer continue on to high school. So when it comes to educational access on the secondary level, it's, it's still a huge uh, barrier in Afghanistan and it's always been. We can proceed to the next slide. So uh, as I'm sure many of you guys are aware, school settings in Afghanistan and the United States, they vary, you know, they're very different from one another. In Afghanistan, the instruction tends to focus on whole groups. It's mostly lecture-based. And so there's going to be very limited engagement between students and teachers. It's not really common for students to provide their feedback or ideas or give their opinions unless they're answering questions uh, asked by their teacher. Students are also expected to memorize a lot of information, to copy notes, and there's a strong focus on penmanship. So you might see uh, students really trying their best to write very neatly because it's emphasized in Afghanistan. Um, when we consider how teaching is designed in the United States, it's, it's different um, than the, what the students will be used to in Afghanistan. For example, working in small groups or centers, these are going to be new concepts for them. There's a level of, of cooperation and collaboration that comes with working in groups, so it could pose a challenge for newly arrived Afghans. It's going to be helpful for educators to spend some additional time teaching or reteaching them how to work effectively in groups and also the importance of sharing their perspectives. I think with this encouragement and feedback and support, it's going to help them to open up and share in time. Critical thinking, concept application, or student-led uh, learning are also going to be unfamiliar concepts. This does not imply, imply in any way that Afghan students are not capable of these things. In fact, they are, and you will find they're very, gonna be very eager to learn and um, be part of a stable learning environment, but teachers might have to just spend a little extra time helping them become more familiar with these concepts. Students might not also have experienced project-based learning or presenting in front of the class or sharing out their ideas. So it's important for teachers and educators to sp spend some time building rapport with their students, which we're going to talk more about in the upcoming sections, um, because this is going to really help them tap into their creative sides, which we know surely exist. 
Uh, students are also unlikely to have had much experience with digital literacy beyond basic web browsing and social media or using their cell phones. Um, Afghan youth are not expected to have sufficient computer skills for tasks such as um, accessing online platforms until they enter college. So that's going to be a huge difference because in the United States, um, students are very comfortable and familiar with this. Given all this information, I want to note that students and their caregivers, uh, you can expect them to feel uneasy about their educational readiness or even maybe their intelligence based on how U.S. education system works. So with that said, I want to introduce you guys to our case study about Mariam, and we're going to build on this case study as we go through the rest of the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you guys. Mariam is a 15-year-old girl from Afghanistan who speaks Dari. She was resettled to the United States with her family about 10 months ago, and she has been a student at your school since last year. She has a strong educational background and her English is improving rapidly. She does not wear a hijab and dresses in Western clothing similar to her classmates. So based on this information that we have about Mariam, we're gonna use Slido again. Um, to answer the question of what uh, changes or challenges might Mariam have experienced as a part of her resettlement journey. So please, once again, if you guys could scan the QR code or go ahead and uh, go to slido.com and enter the code and we'll take a moment to reflect on your responses. A sense of belonging. Yes, I think a lot of people can relate to that. I see more uh, participants typing. We'll just give a second here for them to answer. Fitting in, absolutely. Culture shock, being away from family and friends. Uh, lots of different answers coming in. Feeling ashamed for being different. Yeah, lots of different layers of challenges um, that she might face based on all the changes she's been through. Racist questions, yeah, inappropriate questions, studying in English as opposed to study, feeling proud of her Afghan culture. Thank you guys for these wonderful responses. Um, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Sarah, and she's going to talk to you guys more about specific uh, strategies with when working with parents and with Afghan students. Thanks so much, Medina. Uh, it's great to be with everyone tonight or this afternoon. Um, in this section, we're going to talk about considerations for working with Afghan youth and families. And for the most part, this section is going to address challenges and stressors that these students and families may be facing. And so before we get into that, I want to say that while it's incredibly important to develop your understanding generally of what Afghan families may have and uh, and continue to go through. It's important to remember that Afghanistan's peoples, as Medina was saying, are diverse with different ethnicities and languages and distinctive experiences. Um, and the Afghan education system, as she said, is also, uh, you know, differs across the country um, in terms of the experience that students may have had. Um, so we're going to speak to the range of considerations and stressors that may impact students and families, but this is going to vary from person to person. Each family is different, each person is unique, and likely to have their own individual beliefs and goals and temperament, and they might experience the same events in very different ways. Um, and families and individuals also change over time, evolving as they adapt to their new communities and grow older and more mature and learn new information and have new experiences. Um, similarly, it's critical to, to remember that while they'll face, they will face challenges, every individual and family has important strengths and it's essential to recognize and promote these strengths. And as educators, um, and others working with students and families, you have an amazing opportunity to do this, supporting students and families to leverage their lived experience, their knowledge and skills to feel confident and develop new knowledge and skills. So I'll just encourage you to get to know each and every family and student that you work with. So there are many stressors associated with migration, many of which I'm imagine that many of you are familiar with. 
And a lot of attention is given to pre-resettlement stressors or stressors that are associated with conflict, disaster, or displacement before and during migration. And as Medina also talked about, Afghanistan has endured many decades of conflict leading to the events of 2021. And so many families are still processing those events um, and experiences along with the journey that has brought them here to the US. Many have left loved ones behind and remain deeply concerned about their continued safety. And so these are very real and very helpful to understand. But we want, what we wanted to focus on in this presentation are the stressors that continue or emerge in newly in the resettlement context where you're meeting them. And so we've presented some examples of these stressors on the slide in three different categories, stressors associated with the resettlement process, acculturation stress, and isolation stress. And by resettlement stress, I'm referring to the stress on families associated with establishing how they'll make, meet their basic needs, including housing, food, clothing, and mobility um, in this new environment. And this has been particularly profound for many Afghans as the process uh, of getting to where they are today has been involved many layers and has been quite long. Um, for many, it included a stay um, in another country after leaving Af Afghanistan, for many, it involved a stay on a U.S. military base, possibly for months, followed by time in temporary housing before being able to find a permanent home uh, where they may be living now. And for many, housing may continue to be uh, temporary or unstable. Acculturation stress refers to the stress of figuring out and navigating and adapting to a new cultural environment. And the larger the cultural difference between one's home and one's new cultural environment, the more stressful this can be. And for Afghans uh, in particular, the, um, the cultural dissonance between their home culture and US culture may feel pretty extreme. And for adolescents in particular, acculturation stress can be really serious. Figuring out your identity at during your teenage years um, is one of life's many challenges without layering migration on top of it. Um, and so many Afghan youth may feel that they're living in two worlds, one inside their home and one at school. And the pressure to conform to the dominant culture in each of those environments may feel very strong uh, and difficult to navigate, especially in the context of isolation stress. Um, isolation stress is, is the stress and loneliness associated with being disconnected from one's social support networks, leaving friends and family behind who you always counted on to help you get through stressful times. Um, losing your place in the community or what you sort of felt was your place in a community and that sense of belonging. Um, and, and then experiencing discrimination or harassment um, you know, in this new environment. So feeling, feeling alone uh, makes it even harder to cope with the other stressors that one may be going to. So for educators, it's really important to know that even though families are likely to highly value school and education, it may be difficult to fully engage with school and youth program and, their, and our staff, uh, you know, particularly in the first year of arrival as they navigate all of these stressors and seek to establish that sense of stability and normalcy. Caregivers may be understandably preoccupied with meeting their family's basic needs, um, or they may feel intimidated or unsure of how to interact with schools and educators. For children, um, they may also find it difficult to fully engage in school in the way that educators would like them to, because uh, both because of the stressors that they're facing, but also because of other demands on their time and their energy. They may also have responsibilities outside of school that may make full participation in school difficult, um, make completing homework difficult, make participating in after school activities challenging. Uh, many girls will continue traditions of completing chores and housework before and after school. And boys may have responsibilities for helping uh, elderly family members or other community members with their needs, such as by accompanying them to appointments. Um, and this can also reduce their time that they have to study. 
So any or all of these things could be going on for your students and each of your students will respond to the stressors that they face in different ways. Um, but they may experience these stressors for a long time. It's just not usually a matter of months, you know, before uh, they sort of come out of, of the woods of all of these stressors, they can really persist for some time. Sarah, I want to interrupt really quickly. We have a great sure. question in the Q&A. Uh, what is okay. third culture identity? So this, um, what we're referring to is that sort of children finding that, that go between, that in between, between their home culture and their new culture and being able to preserve what you know, the values that they can feel are important to them while, uh, while maybe taking on some of the, the aspects of the new culture that they also connect with. Um, it's finding that, you know, that sort of third culture that is between uh, those cultures that the one that they maybe came from and the one where they find themselves now. If that makes sense. Thanks so much, Sarah. Shall I advance sure. to the next slide? Please do. All right, so the way that these stressors might show up in your work with youth is the subject of this slide. Um, in addition to traumatic events in one's past that can have a variety of impacts, severe or prolonged stress or what is called toxic stress can also have similar short and long-term impacts on mental health and well-being. And educators may notice students experiencing symptoms such as those that are listed on the slide. And you'll notice that this, these show up in many different ways. This can be cognitive, um, these can be emotional, behavioral, or physical. Um, and so it, stress can lead students to either withdraw or to act out. It's not gonna show up the same um, for every student. So, you know, frequently you might um, have a student that, that complains of a pain that doesn't seem to have a cause or persistent headaches. Um, you may see students, um, you know, who maybe were very engaged at one point, uh, kind of now becoming fearful of trying new things or showing diminished initiative. Um, students may have difficulty completing assignments or, or suffer from some concentration or memory challenges. This can, it can show up in many different ways. We've also heard from many of our colleagues who um, are supporting newly arrived Afghan students that uh, the boys have been responding to situations in which they feel unsafe or insecure uh, aggressively or fighting with each other or their peers. Um, but this can, the important thing to note is that it, stress doesn't um, show up in any, you know, just one way. It can be many different things. Um, and anyone can experience these symptoms, uh, but students experiencing toxic stress may be more likely to experience them. And then for, for each of, uh, or for whichever way it's showing up for a student, the more um, long lasting that is, the more frequently they experience that, or the more severely they experience that, the more important it is um, to help that student access support. So knowing that our Afghan students may be coping with significant stress, we especially want to consider how we're going to support them. So whenever we have an influx of students who are coping with high levels of stress, as many schools have experienced um, and are experiencing and welcoming Afghan students, it's a really good time to assess the systems and strategies that we have in place to support students socially, emotionally, academically, and behaviorally. Um, we can expect when we've got more students experiencing high levels of stress, there's gonna, there may be more fights. There is likely going to be more demand for the school psychologist or the school social worker, um, more need for multilingual staff or interpreters to support those staff to communicate with, with students and caregivers. So the system, you know, needs to uh, maybe be expanded or we need to take another look at how well it's going to um, support the, the challenges that we're going to see. And even students who appear to integrate easily, um, especially at first, will benefit from targeted efforts to ensure their welcome and support their success. In a school or youth program setting, an MTSS framework like you see on the slide can be a really powerful approach to creating climate and culture to support Afghan students and all students for that matter. 
um, a climate and culture that promotes restoration of their physical, uh, psychological, and emotional safety, their sense of control, their sense of belonging, their sense of self-worth, intellectual stimulation, and positive relationships. For those who might not be familiar with, with multi-tiered systems of support, they're proactive frameworks that seek to maximize student achievement and support student social, emotional, and behavior needs from a strengths-based perspective. Tier one supports are universal supports that support that all students can receive or access. They might include curriculum, positive behavior supports, strategies that establish and maintain a positive climate and culture that all staff implement. Tier two are more standardized academic interventions or targeted behavioral or mental health supports for students that present some moderate academic behavioral or social emotional risk factors. And tier three supports are intensive supports for students that experience more severe or persistent needs. And so when, wel when seeking to welcome and support Afghan students, taking a look at how your school or programs address student needs and support uh, their strengths at each level can really be a powerful lens to take. And many of the strategies that Rob's gonna talk about in the next section um, can be considered tier one supports that can strengthen that structured approach to supporting um, all of your Afghan students and, and your whole student body. Um, but consider what supports your school or program provides at tier two and tier three, and how might these need to be expanded or strengthened in order to support your Afghan newcomers. And what I really love about this approach is that it's planful. It takes um, us out of a reactive mode and it puts us in a position of having planned ways to respond to student needs. And that really allows us to feel more capable of supporting our students, um, feel like we've got more tools in our toolbox and that we're applying them you know, in a systematic way that we can then look at and see, is this working or is this not working? Um, and, and actually be data-driven about it. Um, and, then, and it actually allows us to be more successful. So even if your school or your program doesn't use a formal MTSS, you can still apply this approach um, to planning and thinking about how you're gonna support your students uh, in a more informal way. And I just wanna share the example of um, a program that I worked on for many years which was at IRC's uh, Newcomer Youth Summer Academy in New York. And when I first came to the program many years ago now, we didn't have a, a really structured approach for how we were supporting our students to succeed. Uh, maybe teachers were coming from different schools. It was summertime, so we drew on teachers from different schools with different approaches. Everyone sort of brought their own perspective. But the result was that you know, each student in each class had a was getting a different experience. From class to class, the expectations were a little bit different. Um, their experience of the classroom, the language that was being used was a little bit different. Um, and so students didn't have that consistency of like, I know how to succeed in this particular environment. Um, and, and so we started building an MTSS that was really targeted to the students that we were working with who had all come from forced migration backgrounds were almost all multilingual learners um, and building approaches um, in this tiered structure to support that. So at tier one, we really spend a lot of time clarifying student and staff expectations and, and how we create climate and culture that is inclusive and provides um, a platform to build belonging and relationships. We integrated a social emotional learning curriculum. We applied really consistent routines and many, many linguistic supports. Um, and at tier two, we integrated restorative approaches to conflict. We um, built a kind of plan for guided use of a peace corner um, and a de-escalation protocol. And then we looked at, at tier three using um, response to intervention style approaches and, and individual behavior plans. And, you know, there were some other pieces to this uh, puzzle, but overall the 
point is that taking this new, like much more planful approach allowed us to create an environment that just, you could feel the difference when you walked in. You could feel the warm, you could feel um, the consistency. Students were much more at ease. Students by the end of the program where, where they had gone from not speaking to standing up on the stage and singing in front of their peers because they developed those relationships, that rapport and that level of confidence to take risks. And that's what we need them to do if they're going to learn. Um, so that is that's my soapbox on MTSS and how it can help you. Uh, I will move us along now to the bring us back to the case study. So as you remember, Miriam's 15. She speaks Dari and she's in her second year at your school. She's doing well. Um, she's learning English fast and she dresses like her American peers. This year, there are four new students from Afghanistan that will be in the same grade as Mariam. The new students speak Pashto and they're from a rural area of Afghanistan with limited educational backgrounds. These students are more religiously conservative and wear hijab and traditional clothing. With this added information, what are some important cultural considerations um, that you should consider in general and for each student in the classroom. So we'll go back to Slido and you can put your responses for us to see and reflect on. Risks of bullying, treating them individually, absolutely. Yeah, you might anticipate some some um, challenges around. Sorry, this is there. You guys are typing way too fast for me. I can't keep up. Uh, this is excellent. Uh, you might want to consider giving students opportunities to pray. So there might be religious considerations. You want to make um, make space and time for that in your school or your program. We might want to give them choices about, uh, you know, if there are uniforms or, you know, gym clothes. There might be tensions between the groups of students. We want to talk about respecting each's individual choices. Definitely to, there's a definite theme here of making sure that we see each, each of the students as individuals and sort of meet them where, where they are and see how we can um, welcome each of them into the school. All right, I think I'm gonna pass it over to Rob. Thanks everyone for participating. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, really grateful also for you, Medina, the both of y'all creating the, the foundation for how we're gonna ground these strategies and tools for creating healing schools and classrooms. So we're gonna look for ways that we can find actionable guidance on how to create these classrooms to be welcoming, inclusive, culturally and linguistically responsive and healing environments for Afghans and other students who have experienced forced migration. So one thing we want to note is, is with the diversity of experiences of newcomers, it's impossible to create a one size fits all approach. There's no one way uh, to honor the newcomers' as diverse ex experiences and identities through one single strategy. However, there are guiding principles that we want to suggest as very helpful, including engaging and approaching as students with and families with cultural humility, acknowledging that we might not know everything about a particular culture. Uh, even if we come from the same country as someone, they may come from another tribe or another ethnic group, uh, knowing that the linguistic things might be different between Dari and Farsi. Uh, we also want to suggest that there are appropriate supports related to linguistic and religious needs. So before someone had mentioned, you know, creating space for uh, whichever of those girls wanted to pray, if that was something that was part of their practices in, in the everyday. Uh, so that's one of those really helpful strategies as well. It's something to keep in mind. Uh, and it's really important to respect cultural differences and refrain from making assumptions. So just because you've worked with one Afghan learner doesn't mean the next Afghan learner that you interact with is going to have the exact same experience. So 
to set, suspend judgment and allow the students and the clients that you're working with to advocate for themselves and to share their own experiences. So in terms of how we are going to talk about these strategies, I wanna first frame what the outcomes, uh, the intended outcomes for uh, employing some of these strategies will be. So when supportive relationships are coupled with safe and supportive learning environments, educators can create the maximum opportunity for students, especially those recovering from traumatic events to learn, grow, and thrive. So healing classrooms and learning spaces help students achieve the following. First, a sense of control. So feeling safe and secure is really important. Uh, these students have overcome a great deal of change in the past months, years of their lives, and they've now been placed in a new setting uh, where things may be unfamiliar and they've lost a sense of mastery. And that's something that's so important in development is having a sense of, I know what's going to happen. I can control my place in this. And so we want to foster and cultivate uh, environmental factors that lead to our students having that sense of control. We want to make sure that students have a sense of self-worth, that they feel capable and confident, that they're able to build their self-esteem, set goals and say, I can achieve that, and create strategies for themselves to be able to achieve their goals. We want to foster a sense of belonging. We want a school community that celebrates who they are so that they feel included, cared for, and accepted. Uh, we want our students to feel part, part of a group and valued by the community uh, for who they are and their diverse and really uh, important experiences. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to make sure that our students are able to create positive relationships. These involve relationships with educators, with other staff at schools, and with other students. Uh, these relationships should be characterized by mutual respect, trust, transparency, and collaboration. It is so important that our students feel seen, heard, understood, and valued by all those in the school environment. And finally, intellectual stimulation is something we want to make sure that all of our students have access to. Uh, we need our students to feel capable. As Medina was saying before, they, have, they might have a different learning style from before, uh, but that doesn't mean that if they're not accustomed to the way in which uh, schools operate in the United States, that they're not looking for ways to grow intellectually and academically. Uh, so what we can do as educators, as caseworkers, is look for ways to use a strengths-based approach and to take the knowledge that they already have and help them build bridges uh, into new ways of learning so that they have opportunities to learn new content um, using both the past content and the future that they are growing in. So how do we do it? The meat of the question, how do we support and use strategies to help create healing classrooms and learning spaces. So a lot of this, like Sarah said, is gonna fall into those sorts of tier one supports in the MTSS model. Uh, so these are general practices that uh, you'll probably look at and say, these are probably good strategies for all of your students, but we wanna talk specifically about the kinds of ways that you can keep these considerations and strategies tailored to the experience of Afghan students. So one, we can increase predictability and consistency. As we said, students who have experienced severe adversity, like through my forced migration, need a predictable environment in order to get, regain a sense of stability and control in their lives. So how can we do that? Uh, kind of like Sarah said, we need to be really planful. So this involves taking time proactively instead of reactively to consider your school's orientation practices and to say, what are the ones that uh, you know, an Afghan student might not have a frame of reference for. Someone who might have had limited formal education might not understand uh, class changes as they function in the United States. They might not understand the different roles of staff in your school. So taking time to go through some of those things that might be basics for your protocols at school uh, and doing so in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way is very important. Uh, it's also important to implement routines consistently. Uh, we know that the school environment is not always uh, conducive to consistency. That being said, there are some things that we can anticipate. For example, if you know that there's going to be a fire drill one day, a uh, fire drill can be upsetting for a lot of reasons. It's loud, it's noisy, it's jarring, it can be surprising. Um, and if that was made in an announcement over an intercom, a student who has limited English proficiency might not have understood that. So we would say it's important to have time separately with any of your limited English proficiency students 
and explain what the fire drill is, what it's for, when it's going to be happening, what is the protocol. That way it might still be jarring, but it is important to um, create space to anticipate that this might be triggering for this student. Um, if there is an outsider coming in, we wanna be sure to say, oh, that we have a guest speaker that's coming and not only to remind them once, um, but it can be really important to provide several reminders for things that are outside of the norm. The next one is to meet students' emotional needs. While we did see that there are, are a lot of uh, folks in different roles in schools and resettlement agencies on the call, we wanna acknowledge that uh, there are counselors at your schools, there are social workers, and one of their primary jobs is to be responsible for the, the needs of your students socially and emotionally. And not everyone is meant to be providing therapeutic services. Teachers are not meant to be therapists. That's very important for us to acknowledge. That being said, again, we wanna take proactive approaches to taking stock of the social emotional states of our students. Students first and foremost need to feel safe, supported and valued in their learning environment so their brains can relax. That way they can take in and synthesize new information. That also creates a space where they can take risks in order to develop new skills. So sort of like the predictability and consistency portion, think through your lessons in advance and anticipate where triggers might happen. If there's a short story, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that feels culturally insensitive or that feels like it could re-trigger or bring up some feelings of, um, of unrest and unwellness among your students, look for a different story. We've all been there where we've been in a rush to plan for a lesson and we've pulled a lesson or a worksheet without reading it first, but it's so important to create space before and that's the best way we can protect our students and make sure that they are able to learn in a safe space. It's important to acknowledge that students can, if they have trouble concentrating, if they feel overwhelmed or sad, that's okay. We need to normalize that sort of behavior for our students. We also need to acknowledge that errors and mistakes are part of the learning process. Not only are they okay, but they are essential to creating new connections and to synthesize new information as it comes. Uh, so daily self-affirmations or self-compassion, mindfulness exercises or other ideas, anything that you can incorporate, particularly in morning meetings that allow students to feel uh, confident and build their self-esteem uh, also has a lot of pro-social benefits. Next, we have positive empowering group management. So it's really important, again, this has to do with that consistency piece to set clear expectations and calmly apply positive and restorative classroom management practices. That is how we can help our students be successful and by enforcing those expectations uniformly and consistently. So when students feel overwhelmed, like we talked about in terms of the social emotional needs, it's important to have some sort of structure, kind of like Sarah said, that peace corner to create a space in your classroom or a space outside of the classroom where students can step away and reset if they need. Uh, it's also good to ask students what they need. Just because you've come up with something like a peace corner, maybe a student needs a different kind of strategy to sort of reset and recalibrate and that sort of thing. That also creates a space for agency and self-advocacy. Next, you can, yeah, sorry, you can use restorative practices to manage conflict between students, kind of like what Sarah was saying before about those Afghan boys who might be fighting a little bit more. Uh, using restorative practices where you involve uh, you know, a social worker, a counselor to manage that conflict can be really important. We'd also encourage the use of cultural brokers and interpreters in those conversations because there might be cultural pieces uh, that they can contribute to really meaningfully. And the last one I'll share about is using spatial design to foster trauma-informed care principles. Again, I'm going back to that consistency and predictability piece. You probably predicted that yourselves. Um, but putting up lists of expectations and schedules around your classroom using a lot of visuals, less words, more visuals can create a sense of, of control and a sense of mastery uh, in a really visual, tangible way. Uh, by proactively designing learning spaces to promote safety, transparency, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, and mutuality, these students will feel empowered, safe, valued, and in control. You can ask students where and with whom they feel most comfortable sitting. While seating charts feel like an important way to control your class, it might actually inhibit some of our students' ability to learn. For example, if a student is uh, 
has their back to the door, that might leave them feeling really uncomfortable if they've had past experiences where uh, they might have had violence um, through someone entering a room or something like that. So that might be as simple as finding a new seat where they have a better visual of the whole classroom, a better visual of the door. Maybe it's close to the window um, and maybe they're by someone who they've made friends with, right? So that we can sort of address those isolation factors that we discussed earlier. Uh, one last strategy, uh, create space for your students to make their make the classroom space feel like their own. So one idea is to, to allow them to take their artwork and leave it on their desk or have a picture of their family and tape it to the top right corner or something like that, just to make them feel more at home in their space as well. So that, those are a lot of strategies. Want to also acknowledge that you all as educators, as counselors, family liaisons, have your own strategies as well. And so if you have any really neat tools or strategies that you use, we'd love to get those in the chat. You can send those to us, the hosts and panelists. To finish out this section, we want to return to the case study with Mariam. So we've already caught up with Mariam and the four new students of really varying experiences and backgrounds from Afghanistan. And as the school year progresses, you notice that the four new students talk and eat lunch together. They often talk in their own language and laugh together. Mariam has been sitting alone and looking sad. So with that in mind and using the tools and strategies just discussed, how can teachers and school personnel use these strategies for healing classrooms and schools to learn about a student's needs, even when there might be a language barrier? See some typing, feel free to add, again, your own strategies that you employ as well into this Slido if it's helpful. Yeah, eat with her sometimes. So that has to do with the creating positive relationships. So, you know, if she's feeling alone, getting to know her and creating space for her to feel a little bit less alone can be helpful. It's important to be really conscientious of her desires and her agency. Maybe she might feel embarrassed if she's eating with the teacher, but asking on which terms that she would like to um, can be really helpful. Creating structure for peer partners and mentorship. Peer mentoring is so important. Uh, it's so important to find folks who um, are at her age level, at her experience, that sort of thing. Um, one thing to note is that, you know, maybe those four other girls are not quite going to be the right peer mentors for her. And that's okay. They are peer mentoring each other. They're all able to support each other. So it's really important for you as an educator to identify a strong mentor in your class uh, who might be able to support. I love this idea of, you know, the sharing your own background, asking Mariam to teach you. These again, have a lot of those sort of pro-social positive relationship forming activities where you get to know Mariam's more. Uh, staying connected with parents, family engagement can be a real toughie, but it's so good to have so many family liaisons on here. Uh, you know how challenge, challenging that can be, but to express concern and just to say, hey, how are things going at home? Could that be a reason why Mariam's feeling sad? Is it um or is it you know getting an idea of what she's sharing with her family as well can be helpful use a language interpreter help the girls find what they have in common sure yeah i think that can be really helpful especially if this escalates to the point of further conflict um, direct conflict that's disruptive to your class that can be really helpful to create space for mediation yeah these are really great ideas y'all and i wish i had time to read through all of them and shout out all of them um, but for the sake of time I think I'm going to jump ahead. Maybe this one participant still typing. Feel free to throw in your last one. And we have access to these later on, so we can check those out later. Uh, yeah, can printing key items to help with technology overload. Yeah, she might be overwhelmed for a lot of reasons. All right. So thanks, guys, for all of these responses. Uh, really encouraging to know y'all are using these sorts of strategies in your own lives. All right, um, so that brings us to the end of our uh, webinar for today. We probably have time to answer maybe one or two questions. Um, so I do have a question that I have flagged here because I think it's an excellent one to ask. Uh, it says, Cynthia writes, most of our Afghan boys uh, can help our Afghan girls. 
even their siblings who are girls, but they won't. Uh, is, it, is this cultural and we shouldn't push it or should we encourage the boys to help the girls? And I'm actually happy to answer that for you, Cynthia. Um, this is definitely a cultural piece because in Afghanistan, uh, boys and girls tend to be very separated in the educational environment. Um, they are not as accustomed or used to uh, working collaboratively with girls, especially if they're older students, like middle schoolers or high schoolers, they are going to be uncomfortable to want to help them. However, having said that, I would definitely encourage siblings to help one another. Um, that tends to be something that, that, you know, that shouldn't be a problem because they're related. Um, so if in that regard, you said sometimes siblings don't like to help each other. I would definitely encourage that from the school realm. If you're working with the older students though, and they're not comfortable with the opposite gender, that would be something that I would definitely um, be mindful of and respect in that sense. Um, Joyce asks, may I share this webinar with our local schools, principals and educators? Absolutely, Joyce, we'd love for you to share it. Um, it, you guys are going to be receiving this entire slide deck and uh, this webinar is being recorded and you're going to be getting it in the next 24 hours. I think we can go ahead and talk about some resources. I don't see any other questions. Um, so just re oh, reviewing our learning objectives. So we hope that uh, in the time that you've given us uh, today, this evening, we hope that we have met these learning objectives and that you have uh, more of an understanding of the background of Afghan students, where they're coming from, and some core considerations that we've shared with you when working with Afghan students and their families, along with all the amazing, uh, lovely strategies that Rob shared on how to create healing classrooms. So hopefully um, you guys have those takeaways. Um, to leave us with tonight. Here's our list of recommended resources for you. Again, you will be receiving this entire slide deck, but feel free to um, go over these resources to uh, get more information about the topic of supporting refugees or specifically Afghan refugees. And stay connected with us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, through these various outlets, and please check out Switchboard's site for more resources on how to support uh, refugees and Afghan newcomers as well. And lastly, we would love if you could just take a few seconds to uh, fill out our survey. You can either scan this QR co code or it should be dropped in the chat. We'd love to get your feedback. This information is really helpful for us as we develop future trainings and webinars. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope that you guys have found this information useful and that you have a great rest of your day.